Lynn Hiles Ministries presents Dr. Lynn Hiles That You Might Have Life. And here's your host, Dr. Lynn Hiles. I want to welcome you back to the program again today and thank you from the bottom of my heart for uh, tuning in every week and, and joining us. I, I appreciate the fact that you would take time out of your busy schedule to watch us. Uh, if you are unable to watch us during the times that we air a program and you miss these programs and you don't have a DVR where you're recording it, let me just tell you that you can go back to our YouTube page and watch it at any time because everything we have aired to date, again, is archived there and you can go back. I think there's over 300 programs that we've uh, aired that are on our uh, playlist there on YouTube. The easiest way to do that is simply to go to my website at lynnhiles.com and uh, the opening page will have probably the latest television program that we've aired. If you click on it, it will immediately take you to our YouTube page and play straight from there. There's a link there. Uh, secondly, if you uh, say, well, I don't have time to sit down and watch it, but I commute a lot, let me just suggest that you go to our iTunes and, uh, and sign up for our podcast, and you will be able to listen to the audio portion of this in your automobile while you're driving to work or mowing the lawn. Or One of the things I love to do is when I'm mowing, I like to listen to the word of the podcast of somebody that's feeding me, and uh, it's just a good way to redeem time instead of being stuck in traffic with nothing to do but get out you can listen to the Word and be changed by the Word of God. And again, that's very simple. Go to my website again, and there is a link directly from there to uh, the Android feed, to the iTunes feed, all of our social media. You can get it right there, and I believe you will be blessed to do that. And while you're there at the website, if you want to sow a seed into our ministry or become a partner with us, there's an easy way to give there. It is your faithful support that does help us take the gospel around the world. And I want to say to you, I am deeply grateful for those of you who have helped us do that. One of the things I want to say, because the whole series that I've been doing for the last five weeks has been, number one, one of the things I've shared is the power of small. Three, four men, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel, in the midst of a bad political climate, got together and prayed and ended up running the government. Gideon, in the middle of a captivity of the Midianites. God raised him up. And one man in the middle of all of that confusion took 300 men and changed the outcome of Israel. Abraham, with 300 men born servants in his house, defeated the five kings of Chedorlaomer and delivered the kings of Sodom and all of Lot and all of the stuff that happened there. 300 men it doesn't always take big numbers. It's the power of small. I want to say this because I really feel to do it today. Some of the unsung heroes to me are the pastors of these small local churches out in the country somewhere with maybe you feel like only a handful of people. Uh, you know, it's really been those kinds of places that I think have birthed some of the greatest ministries on the planet. The ones you see uh, that seem to make it to notoriety were not always big. You don't really, you know, I look at my own history. I can't talk for anybody else, but I know, I do know some of the others that you watch on TV, and I know they came from humble and small beginnings because we simply believed what God said about us was true and would not let Babylon steal our identity like it did, the, you know, like it tried to do with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But what happens is, is that it starts somewhere in a small group and see, you know, four men again got together and prayed and ended up running the government, changed the outcome. All, all of the stories like that throughout the scripture, God always seemed to take not always the big, but the small and the insignificant and put significance on it and end up changing the world through it. So much so that you would read stuff where he would say things like, if any two of you will agree on earth as touching any one thing, it will be established, it will be done. And so the power of agreement, even in the midst of the power of small, maybe you say, all I have is a home group that I meet in. And man, that's just, listen, everything starts somewhere. Some of the great, great ministries and big churches that are today started in somebody's living room. And I think about, to me, the unsung heroes of the faithful pastors. We, I mean, you know what? Uh, we all take criticism from people 
because of the successful ones, but I, I, I'm i not critical of the successful ones. I'm just glad to see somebody successful doing it. And, and you know, I, I really am not critical at all of that, but I think sometimes the unsung heroes is we don't feel like we are great unless we've got a mega church or we've got multitudes. I'll never forget my son was with me, with me uh, my oldest son, who just planted a church not very long ago and doesn't have all that many people in his church. But, you know, he, we were sitting in this uh, VIP room with a lot of well-known guys, mega churches, and they were talking about the size of their churches. And, and I celebrate that with them. I really do. I'm thankful that multitudes are being reached through their ministries. I have no problem with big. I appreciate that. And so they asked my son, well, how big is your church? He said, I held my head up high and said, I'm not embarrassed to tell you I got 19 people and God has put in my charge and I am proud to serve that 19 people. So I would say to you, if you feel like you only got a handful, listen, Gideon, Abraham, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, all of these people did it with small. And then secondly, I want to say that, you know, what we have found for our ministry personally is that the staple of our ministry and our partner base has not been a lot of times large ministries or wealthy people. It has been the faithful who have been faithful, like, you know, small churches. I, I, I almost want to call names, but I won't do that for sake of uh, uh, just protecting them, but uh, have stood with us even financially and partnered with us in ministry that, you know, have sowed 50 a month, 100 a month, 200 a month, 300 a month, or whatever they could do. And those churches, I want to say to you, you are helping me touch the world. That's not insignificant. And not only are you helping me touch the world, but the people whose lives you touch in your community, if it's just one family or your family. See, you can't measure success by nickels and noses. And I know those things are important, but I also think about Noah who preached for 120 years and his family, eight souls were saved by the preaching of Noah. So, you know, if you can just minister to your family, I think about my own dad and mom. I guess I've been a little bit nostalgic in this series, but it really speaks to me when I think about them when our small. I think about my own mom and dad who, and, and my wife's mom and dad, you know, uh, my, my wife's pa uh, father also was a uh, traveling ministry for years and never stood on major platforms and was not well known. But I think about, you know, they raised their families to serve God. And while my dad has passed on and went home to be with the Lord, my mother's still alive and I'm thankful for that. But they poured into seven children who are literally touching the world. And so you might think it's insignificant. I look back at the times where, where we just gathered in our living room and had home devotions, or we prayed together, or we believed God for something. Then we built our church as, you know, and really when we first started, we just, you know, my dad took a bulldozer and I believe $100. God told him to build a church out here uh, on his farm. We didn't even, we weren't even having a meeting except our meeting with his own kids in the living room in home prayer meetings and, and, and home devotions. And he started digging a hole with that bulldozer and that hundred dollars and never ran out of money until we got a church built and people, when we opened it came, there was about 40 that started with us and we've never ran less than that. Now, a lot of them have been his family and we stood together. But the reality of it is what I'm simply saying is that this family now has literally touched the nations of the earth. So don't ever be discouraged with the power of small. I feel like I'm probably speaking to somebody there today. You're a pastor and you're thinking about throwing in the towel thinking, man, I, I don't know. I've never done this. or I've never, listen, I celebrate you guys. I usually, when I'm in, even in large venues, try to take time for little guys, and especially um, people that, you know, feel like they're insignificant, because sometimes just a word of encouragement can tell you your faithfulness does not go unnoticed before the eyes of the Lord. And you can, uh, you know, it is, it, because it is all of us together, you know, when I think about the story of Gideon that I shared in the last segment and how the Bible said that when Gideon went down to the camp of the enemy, the enemy had had a dream, and, 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 and Gideon is overhearing this story. And this man is telling the story, I saw a loaf of bread roll down the hill, and it smote the tents of Midian. He said, this can be none other than the sword of, of the Lord and Gideon. And, and what that really pictures to me, that loaf of bread rolling down a hill, crushing the tents of the armies of the Midianites, can speak powerfully to me of we being many are one bread. We being many 
our one bread. Now remember when I shared in other segments that the key issue again was, was their diet, bread and wine. But you know, I think, and he said, well, you know, uh, we being uh, many are one bread. I, I think it, I want to take it one step further. First of all, we already, I think, have established very well that when we feed on the bread and wine, we are feeding on the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we feed on his finished work, it qualifies me to be accepted in the beloved. Because the communion bread is not to disqualify you, it is to qualify you. It is his death, his burial, and his resurrection that made you worthy to partake of that bread. So don't ever feel like you are eating unworthily when you discern that it's his body. See, except you eat his flesh and you drink his blood, you don't have any life in you. So that communion is not to disqualify you, but it is to qualify you. Now that's in the book of Corinthians. But just one chapter later, I believe it is, he starts to talk about, you know, that we being many are one bread. And he talks about that the body then has many members. And I want to talk to you today, not just about the power of small, but the power of corporate anointing. Before I do that, I want to read this to you from the book of Exodus chapter 30, because this is Moses, God giving him instructions on how to make the, uh, how to make the anointing oil. In verse number 22, this is Exodus 30, and moreover the Lord spoke to Moses saying, take thee also under the principal spices of pure myrrh, 500 shekels, of sweet cinnamon, half so much, even 250 shekels, and of the sweet calamus, 250 shekels, and of the cassia, 500 shekels, after the shekel of the sanctuary, and of olive, of oil, of, uh, and of oil, olive, and hen. And thou shalt make it, watch this, thou shalt make it an oil of holy anointment, an ointment, watch this again, compound. Put that word on your lips, compound. An ointment compound after the art of the apothecary, and it shall be a holy anointing oil. And thou shalt anoint the tabernacle of the congregation therewith, and the ark of the testimony, and the table, and all his vessels, and the candlestick, and all his vessels, and the altar of incense." and the altar of burnt offering with all his vessels and the laver and his foot, and thou shalt sanctify them that they may be most holy. Whatever touches them shall be holy, and thou shalt anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. And thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, This shall be a holy anointing oil unto me throughout your generations. Now what I want you to see is the power of corporate anointing. When I begin to look at this scripture again, he says, thou shalt take to thee principal spices. Take stacti, take cinnamon, take uh, oil, uh, um, uh, the oil of olive. Take these five ingredients, and interestingly enough, it's five. I could talk about five-fold ministry, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. But I don't want to make this exclusively about five-fold ministry. This is a compound. And, uh, you know, and, 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 and I started thinking years ago, I taught a series titled The Art of Corporate Anointing or The Art of the Pothic Care. I forget what the name of the series was. But what I talked about is, first of all, oil or the anointing does not fall. Somebody has to make it. Thou shalt make it a holy anointing oil. And the anointing oil comes when you bring all the ingredients together. And I started looking at this thing, that bringing this oil together. This guy called an apothecary would compound these ingredients. And it would, one, one ingredient by itself was phenomenal, but you put them together and it becomes a compound. Think about that a minute. It's like taking sand, concrete, gravel, and water and mixing it. All of them by themselves form one kind of substance, but you can't build anything on it. But you mix all of them ingredients together, and you're going to come up with concrete. It's the same way, I believe, with anointing oil. When you bring the corporate anointing together, we individually are valuable, and we have substance within us. And we may be cinnamon, or we may be stack tea, or we may be galbanum, or we may be one of these ingredients. But when we bring it together as a corporate gathering, what is in one compound releases something in another compound, and it becomes a compound. Hear that word, a compound anointing, a corporate anointing. There is power in the corporate anointing. That's why I so love the corporate gathering. That's why I love the local church, because we individually have something. And I'm not taking anything away from the individual. 
But see, we being many are one body. We being many are one loaf of bread. It, to take a loaf of bread, you've got to put flour, you've got to put uh, oil, you've got to put water, you've got to put yeast. It's a compound. In other words, every joint has something that it supplies. I thought about when I was teaching this years ago how the Song of Solomon, he says concerning the woman who is the picture of the bride of Christ, he said, all of the chief spices are in thee. Thou are, he said, you're a garden enclosed, you're a spring shut up, you're a well of living water. And he starts to list all of these things that she is, and she, and she begins to talk about in that place. He says uh, that, that his name is like an ointment poured forth. His name is Christ. And the word Christ means anointing. His name is like a ointment poured forth. Therefore, the, the virgins love thee. Christ means anointing, but Christ has a body. We are the body of Christ. And since this is a corporate, many-membered body, then in thee are all the chief spices. I believe everything we need is somewhere locked up in the body of Christ. If we could ever begin to bring our ingredient and blend it together in a corporate expression and quit trying to be the head and the big shot and start blending as a body, I believe we will see a manifestation of anointing that's poured first of all on the head, which is Christ, and then flows down over the beard to the skirt of his garment so that no matter where you touch him, whether it's the head or you touch the body, the same anointing that's on the head is on the body. What is it the psalmist says? Behold how good and how pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment that was poured on the head. So when we come together as a body in unity, it creates this flow of anointing from the head down to the skirts of the, of the garment so that if you're a woman with an issue of blood, all you have to do is touch the hem of his garment. The whole house is anointed. When you begin to come down through the story here, even in the book of Exodus, he said, you anoint the tabernacle, you anoint the altar, you anoint the, the, the incense. You anoint, in other words, the whole house is anointed. I, I get a little bit bothered about these guys that think, you know, uh, they say, you know they're like, I, uh, I can't be in public and I can't be out here with the people because I, I, I don't want to contaminate the anointing. Listen, you're anoint if your anointing is that volatile, you don't have an anointing. Let me just say that as clear as I know how to say it. Your anointing is not that volatile because what it tells you here in the book of Exodus is whatever this anointing touches becomes holy by reason of the anointing oil that's on them. So if your anointing is not more powerful than what's going on around you, you might be preaching the wrong gospel. For great Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. You don't have to protect the anointing. The anointing will protect you. Matter of fact, demons will scream and run when they, they find somebody that's really walking in an anointing. They'll cry out, let us alone. What have we to do with you? Your anointing is not that volatile. It's not broken by, you know, uh, somebody touching you that maybe ought not touch you or whatever. Because I'm going to tell you, under the old covenant, you, you, you might take this principle and say, well, you know, the, the Bible says that if you touch somebody that's got leprosy, you become unclean by reason of that leprosy. Yes, I agree with that under the old covenant. But in the new covenant, uh, whatever touched Jesus, if it was a leper, he didn't become unclean. They became clean by reason of his cleanness. Matter of fact, everything that disqualified you under the old covenant, Jesus took upon himself so that you would be qualified in the new covenant. But I believe as we begin to take these different ingredients and we begin to bring them together and we begin to realize that all the chief spices, the writer of the Song of Solomon says, all of the chief spices are in you. We say stuff like Christ is the answer. And we don't, first of all, even know the question, yet alone the answer. But, 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 but you might say, well, how is Christ the answer? Well, first of all, Christ individually is the answer in your life. But secondly, we need to understand that Christ is the answer corporately. Everything we need, I believe, I believe everything that we need is somewhere locked up in the body of Christ. I believe the finances that we need to do the work of the kingdom is locked up in the body of Christ. I believe there are healings and miracles locked up in people who have sat in church pews and warmed the pews and, you know, have never uh, been allowed to function or flow. That maybe there are many weak and sickly among us because we've not discerned the Lord's corporate body. We've not realized that the guy you marginalize might be the guy that's got your healing. 
I'll never forget years ago, I was in a place and they were teaching, don't ever let anybody that's beneath you lay hands on you. To which I say, first of all, that's absolutely absurd because who do you think is below you? I just don't see it like that. But when you begin to realize, listen, you might be cutting your nose off to spite your face, so to speak, because the very thing you might need might be standing in front of you. I'll never forget then right after I was at the church that was talking about, you know, uh, don't let anybody touch you or put hands on you that's beneath you. That in, The very next week I was in a meeting where this evangelist laid hands on a bunch of 12-year-old kids and said, come up here, I just want to lay hands on you, stir up the gift of God, and then I want you to get in your heart somebody that the Lord has drawn you to in that congregation. And I want you to go lay hands on them. And I'll never forget this because I was sitting in that meeting with some physical problems in my physical body. And this little 12-year-old 12 boy, 12 boy locked eyes with me. And when he did, I knew the moment this kid touched me, I was going to be healed. Now you say, you know, uh, see, if I would not have humbled myself, of course, I don't ever feel like I'm greater than anybody anyway. I think sometimes people may be intimidated when they see a man of God and say, well, you know, we, how could he need anything from me? We need one another. And I believe God purposely did it that way so we would depend on one another and function as joints of supply and not just joints of need. But when this kid laid his hand on me, pain immediately left my body. He was not a great evangelist. He was not a well-known person. But the Lord touched this man of God through that little boy. I think sometimes many are weak and sickly among us, not because we don't have the goods, but because it's locked up somewhere in the body of Christ. And one ingredient may be the key that releases the other ingredient. It's amazing to me that there was some things in here that were, you know, some of it was, was uh, uh, sweet spices, sweet cinnamon, or uh, spices that were maybe bitter. But when you add the bitter and the sweet together, the sweet calamus, and uh, it's amazing to me that it only took us half as much sweet to counteract the bitter. That the bitter things that are in our lives, uh, you know, that the, uh, could be enhanced by getting around somebody who's not going to feed into the bitterness, but's going to bring some, some sweet back into your life. I, I just think there are people anointed in the body of Christ to make us laugh. There are people in the body of Christ that make us come out of the dumps and the, the mully grubs and the complaint because you get around some folks, they ain't going to let you sit around and murmur and complain and gripe and growl. They're going to begin to speak some things into you and it's going to begin to, that sweet, it's going to begin to overpower the bitter. I can't help but think about cinnamon, you know. Uh, if you take cinnamon by itself, it is a very bitter substance. But you take that cinnamon and you put it on, my mother used to take bread dough. And she would take that bread dough and roll it out like she's going to make cinnamon buns. And she would spread butter. I mean gobs of butter on this cinnamon buns. And then she would shake this cinnamon on that. And then she would pour uh, uh, sugar on top of that and then bake that. And those ingredients would become a compound. And that bitter cinnamon mixed with that sweet sugar and that butter oozing out of the top of it would just, I mean, be in, like, I mean, it was incredible. I, some of you can almost touch, taste it right now. And, uh, but, but what was once bitter had now become so palatable and so good. And actually, there's a lot of properties in, in cinnamon that's good for healing. You take cinnamon and honey in it and mix it together, uh, and you take cinnamon or, or honey from your local region and area, and it's good to get rid of uh, uh, all kinds of allergies because the bees have taken all the stuff that was in your environment and turned them into something that is a compound that can actually have healing properties inside of it. I think we're a long way from unlocking all the substance that's in the body of Christ. But I think the moment we begin to realize that there's power in small, there's power in identity, there's power in agreement, and there's power in corporate anointing, that when we come together in that corporate anointing, that there is an anointing that is released that's first of all for the head to pour our anointing and our praise on Him, and then allow the body of Christ to function. Sometimes it can get out of hand, and sometimes there's some crazy stuff that can happen. But until we get vulnerable enough, or if you will, desperate enough, to let God move, I think we're going to continue to see problems. 
I think one of the things that's a tragedy to me is we're not allowing time for God to move in our services. People come through, uh, you know, as it were, almost a drive-through service, and there's not time to encounter the presence of the Lord. Sometimes it takes time to encounter the presence of the Lord, and it takes people gathering together in a place where they can begin to bring their spice and their ingredient and can begin to submit it to the apothecary. You know, this apothecary guy was a guy that was either used to be a pharmacist. He made medicines. He mixed medicines. He mixed embalming fluids. He made anointing oil, and he made uh, incense offerings. That's what, when the writer of Ecclesiastes gets a hold of it, he says there are dead flies in the ointment of the apothecary. If there was dead flies in it, it was a false anointing oil because in the incense offering itself was an ingredient called galbanum. And galbanum was a gum from a tree base that was used as an insect repellent. God literally put in the incense offering an insect repellent. I said, God, why did you put an insect repellent in the incense offering so that when they're burning these candles, it was almost like a citronella candle. It it warded off all the flies and the mosquitoes. And the Lord said, I did that for Beelzebub. I said, really? He said, I did that because when you get the praise right and you get the anointing right, you won't have a devil within a country mile. The flies will run for their life because there's already built into the praise. That's why you ought to praise God. And no matter what's going on, all things give thanks because it's like spreading the place down with, with, with raid. I mean, when you start to praise and you start to worship, you won't have to rebuke devils for an hour. All you have to do is give God some praise. And when you give God praise, the demons will flee at the name of Jesus and at that kind of an atmosphere. So replace your chasing devils with a bunch of praise and worship and you watch and see there'd be a powerful breakthrough. Replace your false identity with a new identity in Christ. Replace your feelings of inadequacy and realize that the power of small can do great things. See yourself as God sees you. Bring then your ingredient and bring it to the apostles and it may turn into medicine instead of embalming fluid, instead of death in our midst. Life will begin to flow as a result of our coming together and saying, I'm a joint of supply. I'm a part of the body of Christ, and His name is like an ointment poured forth. Therefore do the virgins love thee, and it will attract people into a manifestation of the power of God that can only happen in the midst of corporate anointing. Let's be apothecaries and blend together our spices and let God use us. We're about out of time. I want to thank you for joining this segment again. and. Uh, Take a moment, if you would, to call that number on the screen. If you would like to show into the ministry and become a partner with us or a one-time gift, you can also do it very simply by going to our website. There's a place there to give and even to sign up for, uh, you know, like a monthly debit if you'd like to do something like that to become a partner with us. It takes your support to do this. You probably already know that. But if you're enjoying what you see and what you're hearing, why not become a partner with us today? Because it does enable us and help us to take the gospel around the world. Thank you for being a part of that. God bless you for watching again this week. I'm very excited to announce the release of my newest book. It is titled From Law to Grace, A Kingdom Paradigm Shift. In this book, we talk about how the gospel is not about a law you have to keep. It is about receiving a life that will keep you. It is not about living this life out of fear. It is about living a life of faith. It is not about rules. It's about a relationship with a loving father. It is about moving from the old covenant government of condemnation to the new covenant government of affirmation. It is about living life as a citizen of the kingdom right now.